Hello Grade 10s and welcome to this lesson in the series on the atom. Today we will try to understand the size and structure of the atom. We will also look at the structure of the nucleus of the atom. Atoms are extremely small submicroscopic particles. This means that they are so small we can't even view them under a microscope. What we will cover today is based on the Rutherford atomic model. We will try and get a rough estimate of the mass and diameter of an atom. Rutherford's experiment showed that an atom is mostly empty space with the mass concentrated in the central nucleus. Because the mass and diameter of atoms are so small, we have to use scientific notation when writing down atomic mass or atomic radius. Since the mass of subatomic particles are so small, we will also use a more convenient unit for talking about atomic mass, namely relative atomic mass. We will use the periodic table to work out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in a neutral atom. We will also explain the term isotope and calculate the relative atomic mass for elements with isotopes. Let's cross over to Diyasha to recap what Rutherford did in his famous experiment. In our previous lesson, we had a look at how Rutherford bombarded a thin piece of gold foil using alpha particles. His results were most unusual. Looking at his results, he made conclusions about the nucleus of the atom that we still accept as true today. Now, in this metal foil, there are many atoms. Each atom has a positive nucleus, surrounded by electrons. Let's go to an open field to give you an idea of the distance between the nucleus and the closest electron. This sphere represents the center of the atom, the nucleus. Can you see the shiny object in the distance? This represents electrons. Do you see that the space between the electrons and the nucleus is huge? In comparison, the nucleus is very, very small. Use this model to predict what would happen to most of the alpha particles fired at the gold foil. I think you can see that most of the alpha particles will pass between the nucleus and the electrons without being deflected or scattered. There is a lot of empty space inside the atom. In Rutherford's atomic model, he proposed that the electrons move around the nucleus. Here is the helium atom. Electrons orbit around the nucleus. This is similar to the way that the planets orbit the Sun in our solar system. Here we see the planet Jupiter in orbit around the Sun. In science, we often work with very large numbers, such as the distance of planets from the Sun, or very small numbers, such as the diameter of an atom. These numbers can often be written more easily in scientific notation. In scientific notation, the general form is written as n times 10 to the power n. So we have both a decimal number between 0 and 10 and an exponent. Let's first look at a very big number. What is the distance of Jupiter from the Sun? Jupiter is approximately 778 million kilometers from the Sun. Let's write the number out. 778 million. To write this number in scientific notation, we count from the last zero and move the decimal place so that we write an integer between 0 and 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We say this number as 7, 7, 8 times 10 to the power 8. The exponent is positive and this tells us that this is a very large number. Let's now look at a very small number. What is the diameter of a helium atom? Remember, the diameter is a straight line going through the center of a circle to two points on the circumference. In this case, the center of the circle is the nucleus of the helium atom and the circumference is the outer energy level at which the electrons are found moving around the nucleus. The diameter of a helium atom is 1,012 picometers. Let's write the number out. 0,000000 
zero 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 one zero one two. To write this number in scientific notation, count from the decimal place or comma and move the decimal place so that we write an integer between zero and ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We say this number as 1, 0, 1, 2 times 10 to the power negative 12 meters. Since the exponent is negative, this tells us that this is a very small number. Now let's discuss the mass of an atom. It is possible, with a special instrument called a mass spectrometer, to determine the mass of a hydrogen atom or the mass of a carbon atom. The mass of a hydrogen atom is 1,67 times 10 to the power negative 27 kilograms. The mass of a carbon atom is 1,99 times 10 to the power negative 26. But these numbers are very small and it is difficult to compare how much bigger the mass of one atom is to another. So we need a more convenient way to measure the mass of an atom. This unit is called the Atomic Mass Unit, AMU. Let's cross over to Dayasha to find out more about the unit and the nucleus of the atom. Now remember, Rutherford also found that a few alpha particles bounced straight back. He used this evidence to explain that the mass of the atom is compressed into a very small region found at the center of the atom. This region is called the nucleus. Protons and neutrons are extremely small subatomic particles. But even though they are small, they represent all the mass in an atom. The mass of subatomic particles is measured in atomic mass units. Every single proton and neutron has a mass of one. So every proton and every neutron weighs one atomic mass unit, written as one AMU. Each proton is positively charged, but neutrons are neutral, or in other words, they have no charge. Both subatomic particles, protons and neutrons, are found in the nucleus, so they are called nucleons or nuclear particles. We also now know that both protons and neutrons have a mass of one atomic mass unit each. Let's take a closer look at an example of a boron atom. This atom has one, two, three, four, five protons and six neutrons. Can you find the mass of this nucleus measured in atomic mass units? Take a few moments to write down an answer. Each proton has a mass of 1. Each neutron has a mass of 1. So in total, the mass will be 5 plus 6 equals 11. So the total mass of this nucleus is 11 AMU. This number is called the atomic mass number. This number has a symbol A. It is the number of nucleons in the nucleus. Now try another calculation on your own. Fluorine has 9 protons and 10 neutrons. Find the atomic mass number, or A, for an atom of fluorine. Next, I want to tell you about a scientist named Aston. He discovered a very curious thing. He found that not all atoms of the same element have the same number of neutrons. How strange. Look at the element neon, for example. Some of its atoms have 10 protons and 10 neutrons. Other atoms have 10 protons but 11 neutrons. The rest of the neon atoms have 10 protons and 12 neutrons. These are called isotopes of neon. What remains constant in all three types of neon atoms? Yes, the number of protons remains constant. So, we can define an isotope of an element as an atom with the same number of protons, but 
a different number of neutrons. This discovery also shows us another very important thing. The atoms of each element have a unique number of protons in the nucleus. In other words, all the atoms of hydrogen have only one proton. It can never have more or less. This is such an important number that it is used to order the elements in the periodic table. The number of protons in the nucleus of an atom tells us which element we are dealing with. The number of protons of an element is called the atomic number. It is represented by the symbol Z. Now, protons are positively charged, but an atom as a whole is neutral. So, the number of electrons, the negatively charged subatomic particles, must be the same as the number of positively charged protons. For example, neon has 10 protons that are positively charged. How many electrons does it have in order to have an overall neutral charge? For every positive, there must be a negative. So, the neutral neon atom must have 10 electrons. Now, we know three things about the subatomic particles of the atom. Firstly, the number of protons plus the number of neutrons gives us the atomic mass number A. Secondly, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons in a neutral atom. And thirdly, the number of protons is called the atomic number Z. The atomic number is very important. We can find it on the periodic table. Let's have a look. Every hydrogen atom has only one proton in the nucleus. Hydrogen fits into the left top corner of the periodic table. In its block, you will see the number 1. This is the atomic number Z, or the number of protons in the hydrogen nucleus. Helium has two protons in its nucleus, so its atomic number Z is 2. A carbon atom has six protons in its nucleus. Its atomic number Z is 6, and the number 6 will be seen in carbon's block in the periodic table. On some periodic tables, the larger number indicated at the bottom of each element's block is the atomic mass number. Can you see a relationship between the atomic number Z, the atomic mass number A, and the number of neutrons? Remember, the atomic mass number A tells us the number of nucleons in a nucleus. The number of protons in the nucleus is the atomic number Z. The number of neutrons equals the number of nucleons minus the number of protons. Look, we can show this for the element sulfur. Sulfur has an atomic number Z of 16 and a mass number A of 32. A minus Z equals the number of neutrons. So 32 minus 16 gives us 16 neutrons. Now, do you remember that Rutherford used alpha particles in his experiment? With all the information that we have discovered today, can you figure out what an alpha particle is? Here are some clues. The alpha particle has an atomic mass number of 4 and an atomic number of 2. The alpha particle is in fact a helium nucleus. Now remember that every nucleus is not exactly the same. Aston discovered that elements can exist as different isotopes. This means that not all the atoms of an element have the same mass. Look at this periodic table. Can you find a decimal number? Yes. Carbon has a decimal number written here. But what does this decimal number represent? We know that half protons or half neutrons don't exist, so it must have something to do with the isotopes of carbon. There are two common isotopes of carbon atoms. All carbon atoms have six protons, 
but only one type has six neutrons. The other has seven neutrons. This means that the mass numbers for the different carbon isotopes are 12 and 13. These isotopes occur in fixed proportions. In any sample of carbon, 1% is carbon-13 and 99% is carbon-12. An average mass of all these isotopes is calculated, taking into consideration the fixed proportions. This is known as the relative atomic mass. We need to be able to calculate the relative atomic mass of an element from the percentage of each isotope in a sample of an element. So how would you do this? Let's look at a sample of chlorine gas. Chlorine gas is a yellow poisonous gas. Chlorine gas has two naturally occurring isotopes, namely chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. 75% of the total is chlorine-35 and 25% is chlorine-37. Calculate the average relative atomic mass of chlorine. First, we calculate the mass contribution of chlorine-35. 75% of chlorine atoms have a mass of 35 AMU. Divide the percentage abundance of this isotope by 100. Multiply this by the atomic mass of this isotope. The contribution of chlorine-35 is 26,25 AMU. Now, do the same for chlorine-37. 25% of chlorine atoms have a mass of 37. So 25 divided by 100 times 37 gives us 9,25 AMU. Now, add these two values together to find the average relative atomic mass of chlorine. So 26,25 plus 9,25 is 35,5 AMU. You should now have a picture in your mind of how tiny the atom really is and of the particles that make up the nucleus. You should also know how to calculate the relative atomic mass and how to determine the number of protons and neutrons in an atom. We have covered quite a lot of content, so make sure you practice these skills by doing the task for this lesson in the task video. You can also visit the Mindset website www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye and thank you Grand Tens for joining us today. Hello grade 10s and welcome to this lesson in the series on the atom. Today we will try to understand the size and structure of the atom. We will also look at the structure of the nucleus of the atom. Atoms are extremely small submicroscopic particles. This means that they are so small we can't even view them under a microscope. In this metal foil there are many atoms. Each atom has a positive nucleus surrounded by electrons. Let's go to an open field to give you an idea of the distance between the nucleus and the closest electron. This sphere represents the center of the atom, the nucleus. Can you see the shiny object in the distance? This represents electron or atomic radius. Since the mass of subatomic particles are so small, we will also use a more convenient unit for talking about atomic mass, namely relative atomic mass. We will use the periodic table to work out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in a neutral atom. We will also explain the term isotope and calculate the relative atomic mass for elements with isotopes. Let's cross over to Dyasha to recap what Rutherford did in his famous experiment. In our previous lesson, we had a look at how Rutherford bombarded a thin piece of gold foil using alpha particles. His results were most unusual. Looking at his results, he made conclusions about the nucleus of the atom that we still accept as true today. Now, microscope. What we will cover today is based on the Rutherford atomic model. We will try and get a rough estimate of the mass and diameter of an atom. 
Rutherford's experiment showed that an atom is mostly empty space with the mass concentrated in the central nucleus. Because the mass and diameter of atoms are so small, we have to use scientific notation when writing down atomic mass 